The following program has been made possible in part with grants from the City of Erie and the Erie Community Foundation. on this hillside in Harbor Creek 14,000 years ago, instead of seeing Lake Erie and the Erie Basin, we would be seeing instead a wall of ice which extends into Canada as far as we can imagine. As the ice melted, the Erie Basin became uncovered. The meltwater flowing off of the ice filled the basin to different levels depending upon the outlets which were available at the time. Approximately 8,000 years ago, Lake Erie reached its present level. The name of the land is Erie. It comes from the Erie's Indians, who were gone by the time white men arrived. There have been Indians in Erie County, Pennsylvania, since about 10,000 B.C. Most of these Indians from 10,000 B.C. to about 2,500 B.C. are known archaeologically. We then have a time uh, sequence in which we have very little information about the occupants of Erie County until about 500 A.D., at which time we find some Indians who later become the historically known Erie's Indians. The Erie's Indians are found basically from Buffalo, New York, across the southern shore of Lake Erie to about Cleveland and possibly as far to the west as Toledo, Ohio. The Erie's Indians live basically along the lake shore and along streams and rivers uh, close to the lake shore, no more than about five miles inland. The types of sites that Erie's Indians tended to have were village sites located on bluffs, usually at the confluence of various streams or the lake and a stream, and were easily defendable positions. The Erie's themselves, being Iroquoian speakers, were horticulturalists and also hunted and gathered, their main foods coming from maize, beans, and squash, and also the same sorts of game animals, particularly deer, that are found in the vicinity today. The French explorers in this area called the Erie's Indians, the people of the Cat Nation. In an approximately a two-year war, lasting from uh, 1653 to 1655, the Erie's Indians were exterminated by the Seneca Indians at a place called Racon, exactly where we don't know. The survivors of that battle, women and children primarily, were adopted into the Seneca tribe as blood kinsmen. The Seneca victory ended permanent Indian settlement of the territory, although it was claimed by the Iroquois nation for another century. In the 1700s, water was the best way to travel through the wilderness, and the fine harbor at Presque Isle attracted the white man's attention. It led, by a short portage, to French Creek at Le Buff, which led south to the Allegheny River and the forks of the Ohio. It was both a trade route and a military route. In 1753, the French built Fort Presque Isle at the north end of the 13-mile portage and Fort Leboeuf at the south. The forts were linked in the water route from the St. Lawrence to the Upper Ohio and the Mississippi, a French chain which encircled the British. But the British resisted the French and sent young George Washington to Fort Leboeuf to tell the French that they were trespassers. By the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, most of eastern North America was British. The French fort Presque Isle was burned by Indian allies of the British. A new fort took its place, but the English presence didn't last. At the close of the American Revolution, the land which was to become Erie was not part of the new United States, although it had been claimed by five states, including Pennsylvania. Until 1792, 
This four-mile stretch of shoreline just east of the Ohio border was the only lakefront that Pennsylvania owned. Pennsylvania officials devised a plan in the mid-1780s to improve the internal transportation network of the state in hopes of diverting all the commerce possible through the market center at Philadelphia. Part of their plan involved trying to locate a harbor on the shore of Lake Erie with which to bring the produce of the Great Lakes. At the same time that they devised this plan to improve the internal transportation system, they sent out boundary commissioners to try to locate the northern and western boundaries of the state. These boundary commissioners discovered that the two boundaries converged out in Lake Erie and left only this four-mile stretch of Lake Erie shoreline. Presque Isle Harbor, which was their object, lay to the east and was outside the boundaries of the state. The state officials then approached the federal government within whose jurisdiction Presque Isle lay to try to purchase the harbor from the federal government. The transactions took place between 1788 and 1792, resulting in the purchase in 1792 by Pennsylvania. In 1792, a number of different western tribes of Indians and the Seneca tribe of Indians in New York State claimed the Erie Triangle. Pennsylvania government officials began negotiating a series of treaties with these Indians, and the federal government began conducting a war against the Indians, which finally resulted in the transfer of all the territory by these tribes in 1794. Here at the foot of Parade Street is where the town site of Erie originally began back in 1795. The state of Pennsylvania employed two commissioners, Andrew Ellicott and William Irvine, to come here in that year when Erie was still a wilderness and begin to survey it. Ellicott had been the nation's most famous surveyor and had just finished surveying the town site of Washington, D.C. in 1792. Irvine had been the commandant at Fort Pitt during the French and Indian War. Settlers came to the newly named town of Erie from southeastern Pennsylvania and New England. Colonel Seth Reed and his family were early arrivals, as was Judah Colt, an agent for the Pennsylvania Population Company. In 1796, General Anthony Wayne, hero of the French and Indian War, died in the blockhouse at Erie. When his son arrived, he found the trail was too rough for a coffin, so the body was boiled in a kettle, and he took the bones home in a box. In 1800, most settlers farmed. Saw and grist mills were among the first businesses. Money was to be made building and sailing boats, and the hauling of salt from New York State soon established the port's commercial importance. It is good that Erie has this restored Niagara to remind the many people of the importance of this ship to the history of this country and to remind them of the sacrifices made by the early settlers to make the victory of Lake Erie possible. This is one of the six ships built here in 1812 to 1813. They were made possible because Dan Dobbins, a mariner on Lake Erie, obtained permission from President Madison by a trip to Washington to build ships here to protect Lake Erie from the British who had ships on Lake Erie. The Lawrence, the Niagara, and the Ariel were built at the foot of Cascade about a mile to the west. The other three ships, the Porcupine, the Scorpion, and the Tigers were both built here at the foot of Sassafras of Lee's Run. These ships the wood was from the local area. All the other material had to be brought in here from Pittsburgh. And during this time, half of which was during the winter months, it was not easy to assemble these ships and complete them on time. But Dobbins and Perry got them built and over the sandbar at the mouth of the harbor, the fleet sailed west up the lake to put in bay. Perry's crews were young. Many of them had never been aboard ship before. On September 10th, 1813, Perry met the British.
his ruined flagship, Perry accepted the British surrender. We have met the enemy, and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Dobbin's planning and Perry's victory helped win the War of 1812 and establish the northern boundary of the United States at its present location. Daniel Dobbins, with all his foresight, missed the big battle because he was sailing back to Erie for supplies. After the war, the town grew. Industries developed. One of the earliest was the mining, transportation, and smelting of bog iron ore dug near the head of Presque Isle Bay. Erie's Bank of Pennsylvania was the first marble-fronted building west of the Alleghenies, and it came complete with a home next door for the banker. Lake trade was busy. In 1826, three steamers and ten sail schooners were clearing the Sassafras Street docks weekly. Ships were full of cargo and people. People heading west. The port became an important center of maritime commerce, so important that the Navy kept the USS Michigan, later called the Wolverine here, for 79 years. So many of her officers and crew married in Erie that the town became known as the mother-in-law of the fleet. With so many travelers and sailors passing through town, inns and taverns sprang up. John Dixon had this tavern built in 1809 and operated as a tavern until 1826. He catered to the local people, travelers along the lake shore, and even the uh, shipbuilders of Perry's fleet. The second owner, Josiah Kellogg, operated as a tavern from 1826 to 1840. And whether they wanted to come in for a spot, letter writing, or just conversation, it was one of the most popular spots in the area. Soon there were hotels, Brown's Hotel and the Ellsworth House, and the grandest of them all, the Reed House. It overlooked the park at North Park Row in French and was convenient to the Park Opera House, the finest between New York and Chicago. In the 1830s, nothing held more promise than a canal running from Erie to Pittsburgh. It was expected to make the town prosper by providing a transportation link for trade from both the Upper Great Lakes and the Erie Canal at Buffalo. Daniel Dobbins dug the first shovelful of the Erie Extension Canal on July 4, 1838. By the mid-40s, great quantities of cargo and thousands of passengers had been carried on the waterway. The route headed inland from the bay to Fairview and Girard, then swung south to Albion and on to the Ohio River. But by 1851, the year Erie was incorporated as a city, the rumble of the railroads was to be heard, and it meant the end of the canal era. Railroading has always been important in the history of Erie County and the city of Erie. This locomotive is a product of the Heisler Locomotive Works of Erie. The Heisler Locomotive Works, between 1893 and 1941, produced over 800 locomotives for the railroad industry. Other companies in the Erie County area that built locomotives and locomotive components included the Climax Manufacturing Company of Corey, the Standard Stoker Company of Erie, and of course the General Electric Company of Erie. The Erie and Northeast Railroad was built into Erie in 1852 with a gauge of six feet. Coming in from the west was the Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula Railroad, which used a gauge of four foot ten inches. The resulting change of gauge in Erie produced a lucrative business for merchants and hotelmen, as the people riding on the trains had to stay overnight in Erie, and all freight coming through Erie had to be transferred from one car to another. And so it was when the Erie and Northeast proposed to change their gauge to match the four foot 10 inch, there developed a gauge war with the merchants and the citizens of Erie tearing up the railroad right away, bridges and such. The courts issued an injunction that the men of Erie could no longer participate in tearing up the bridges and the tracks of the Erie and Northeast Railroad. Therefore, women began tearing the bridges and tracks of the Erie and Northeast Railroad apart. There have always been speculation as to whether they were actually women or men in women's clothes. But Erie lost that war. Uniform Gage won.
Erie Industry made linoleum, skillets, oil drums, engines, boilers, metal products, organs, pianos, chain hoists, pulleys, stoves, matches, paving rollers, and Carter's Little Liver Pills. But besides the gauge war, Erie lost another battle in the late 1800s. Titusville area oil might have made Erie the center of the oil industry. With 22 refineries here, a plan was developed to build an oil pipeline from Titusville to Erie. It never came about. By 1859, when oil was discovered near Titusville, John D. Rockefeller was established in Cleveland, his hometown. By then, he and other Ohio businessmen had made local investments in transportation, storage, and industrial facilities. The combination of these investments and Rockefeller's tactics made Cleveland the hub of the early oil industry and left Erie a small manufacturing lake port. The Soldiers and Sailors Home, built in 1886, were the survivors of the uh, American Civil War, typifies the men with their battered limbs and battered minds uh, who took part in that terrible war. Here on the home front, Erie's contribution was a naval gun factory somewhere down here uh, on this waterfront. But the main contribution of the war had to be the young men who went and fought in the armies of the North, the men from Erie and Erie County. And it was their fate to be involved in one of the great battles of the war at Little Round Top at Gettysburg, July 2nd, 1863. The situation was this. If the Confederates could put cannon on Little Round Top, which at that moment was held by neither side, these cannon could smash the entire Union line. The first Union officer to recognize the value of this hill was General Governor Warren, and he sent a staff captain racing down to Army headquarters. The captain returned with orders to speed troops to the hill. On his way back, he encountered Colonel Strong Vincent, a young, vigorous ex-lawyer from Erie. Vincent took it upon himself to rush his brigade to that hill, and it was just in time because two Confederate brigades were coming up the other side, and the result was a vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Northern troops won, but at a terrible price. Colonel Strong Vincent was mortally wounded, and his Erie County Regiment, the 83rd Pennsylvania, about 80 casualties that day. Conductor, when you take your slip and get your fare, punch it in the presence of the passenger. Punch it, brother, punch it with the utmost care in the presence of the passenger. One of the first signs of mechanical progress following the Civil War was the trolley. By 1889, an electric street railway system had been put into service, one of the earliest in the nation. Before long, passengers could go almost anywhere in town, and to Meadville, Buffalo, Conneaut, 
by trolley. Erie trolleys ran until 1935. The earliest European immigrants were German and Pennsylvania Dutch, usually Protestant. Some of them arrived in Erie almost as early as the Yankee settlers. By the late 19th century, newer immigrants were arriving, and the established families found themselves allied over the ways of the different newcomers, generally poor and Catholic, often unskilled, with seemingly strange customs and habits. The new arrivals were German and Irish, Italian and Eastern European, but in many ways they were very much alike. Well, I think that the uh, potato famine was one of the big reasons why the Irish began migrating. Uh, history will tell us that uh, a million people left Ireland at one time, uh, and they migrated more to Great Britain and the United States, and they came and brought their families with them. Because when they landed here in Erie, they had to find jobs, and jobs were plentiful with the kind of skill that the Irish had. They had great minds, and they had strong backs. And they worked hard, whether it was digging sewers, laying railroads, or becoming policemen, firemen, the way my family uh, started off. And my grandfather uh, uh, was a sword digger when he started, and became a contractor. And I want to mention the St. Patrick's Church, just 600 feet from where we are right now. That was the reason why we all clustered around this area. St. Patrick's Church. 52 years ago when I came to this country, this corner was called the Little, little Italy. There's the Nova Road right here, the Cali Club over there, the little Italian church right next to the big church there now. And later they opened up the Angelori Supper Club. Mr. Agresti had the printing shop on 17th and Valnot. There's all kinds of little grocery store on each corner here. And we garden the people to come here. They come from all over Italy. They come from Abruzzi, they come from Calabria, from Sicily, from Rome. They move here because there was quite a bit of work on Erie. And they went to the Marbine, they went to the Marx Toy, the National Foundry, and so forth. Griffin. And Mostly when they come from the start, they don't go on those jobs. They had to go pick and shovel, most of the who comes here, including myself. And it is, was a hard work. Today is altogether different. They have machinery to do that work. In those days, we had a pick and shovel. We used to work to the water work department, used to measure two shovels, one, two, and used to say, you dig from here to there. We put a, uh, an old timer. Then you get a new guy, then an old timer. By the time the, the old guy started dig, I mean, the new fellow start, the old guy already had done to, to the end of the dig. It was tough to work in those days. St. Stanislaus Church was completed in 1888. Since that time, it's been, even to the present day, the center of the Polish community in this city. The earliest Poles uh, came here probably with Perry for the Battle of Lake Erie. And then we had a number of scattered individuals that came through in the 1830s. And as we go on, we find that the Polish community began to develop nicely to about 80 families, roughly around 68. About the turn of the century, that is around 1900, this community began a tremendous increase in terms of numbers, in terms of jobs, etc. Most of them came here primarily because of the opportunities in the growing seaport industrial area, but soon we began to see them coming across as businessmen and a variety of people getting into minor political activities, etc. Ethnic groups form and dissolve. New nationalities establish wealth and influence, while others become only names on buildings. The city's true diversity has always been its mix of people, its Russians and Slavs, Greeks and Portuguese.
After the Civil War, the Underground Railroad was over, and some 85 or 90 black families decided to make their home along the Bayfront, which was within the first district of the Fourth Ward of Erie. At that time, there were many who decided to have their own businesses, either within their homes or else they would go out and get what education they could, becoming teachers or postal clerks and doing the work outside of the families. After the First and Second World War, we saw hundreds of black families who came in to take the jobs that were available, helping the war effort. These people stayed in Erie, and they carried on, as the first families had done, working toward the same ends, educating their children for better things to happen afterwards. These pictures on the wall, located in Erie City Hall, outside the mayor's office, not only represent 162 years of distinguished service by citizens of Erie as mayors, they also represent at least four different ethnic epics in which different ethnic groups played the leading political role. These epics included a Yankee phase, a German phase, an Irish phase, and ultimately today, an Italian-Polish phase. The 19th century was the day of the Yankees, in which mayors like Scott and Noble dominated the political picture. They gave way in turn to a series of German mayors, beginning with Saltzman and continuing right through Erie's most classic political boss, Mike Liebel. In the 30s, they gave way in turn to an Irish interregnum in which the Irish mayors from Rossiter to Flatley were the big ethnic and political names in the city. Presently, Erie has entered a new ethnic phase, an Italian-Polish phase, in which Mayor Louis Tullio represents the first. Mayor Tullio representing a coalition that came to Erie 50 to 60 years ago. In 1915, Mill Creek ran north to the bay between French and State Streets. That August 3rd, rain-swept debris blocked the creek. When the dam broke, a flood thundered through the city. 35 people were killed. 225 buildings were destroyed. 800 people were left homeless. were becoming vivid. Homes of the wealthy ornamented the city. But the immigrants, the workers, the poor, often felt excluded from the American dream. Socialism appealed to many in the first and second decades of the new century. But patriotism dampened social activism and turned Erie's efforts toward winning the war to end all wars. became another Cleveland or Detroit was the absence of a single key industry. Commercial diversity, which brought advantages and disadvantages, was always a hallmark. In the 20s and 30s, Erie was the largest producer of freshwater fish in the world. My grandfather and his brothers fished. My father and myself. And it started in before 1900 and been fishing ever since. As the fish were caught, they were all processed, filleted and dressed, packed in ice. And they were shipped to Cleveland, Chicago, New York City in those days. 
Today, most all of the fish are processed in Erie and sold in Erie to restaurants and local people. The land offered good opportunity for farming. Grapes and other fruits were grown along the temperate lakeshore. Vegetables grew well, and dairy farms dotted the countryside. But all ways of life came to an abrupt turn in 1929. Erie being an industrial city and, and strictly industrial, of course, uh, the Depression uh, hit Erie much harder than it did uh, many other sections of the country. Of course, all industrial sections were hit, but uh, many lost their jobs. And right across the street from where I'm sitting, uh, uh, Tom Sturt, who was a uh, columnist of the period, started, uh, got a group of men to start a soup kitchen. And uh, the city hall is uh, in that, at, on that site right now. And uh, they called it Mulligan Hall for people who, rather than starve to death, could go down and get uh, something to eat. Of course, uh, in the working classes, well, as well as in the upper crust, they, uh, many people lost their homes, including myself. I was sold out. But uh, it was general, and there was no disgrace in it in those days because uh, we were all in the same boat. We're in the money. We're in the money. We've got a lot of fun it takes to get along. We're in the money. The skies are sunny. Oh, man, depression, you are through. you done us wrong. Once. By 1935, things started picking up a little bit, and of course it took the war to uh, bring us back to what we call normal again. I hope it doesn't take another war to bring us back to normal. Depression and World War II had major impact on the American industrial and labor scenes. Industry was faced with retooling to a peacetime economy. Returning servicemen needed work. Like the rest of the nation, manufacturing adjustments were successfully made, and unions proceeded to consolidate more than three decades of hard-won gains. Leary, known since the 1890s as the steam engine and boiler capital of the world, saw much of its industry grind perilously close to a halt during that awesome depression of the early 1930s. An industrial recovery, here as elsewhere, was not to follow in significant volume until our nation began production to assist those European countries resisting armed invaders in the latter part of the 30s. Leary's substantial industrial progress during these years of change since World War II has come to us almost exclusively via the growth achieved by our already established manufacturing plants, such as hammer mill, for example. Also, our industries have become less city concentrated as expanding firms have chosen to erect new and larger facilities in the not so crowded county areas, heretofore strictly agricultural. 
Well, today, that steam engine of yesteryear is mostly memory in a modern industrial Erie County, employing the highly sophisticated technologies and tools of a computerized electronic age. Included among uh, uh, industry's numerous past half-century attainments here is Erie County's presently recognized rank as one of the USA's major plastics manufacturing centers. In full production times, our Erie County industries routinely provide jobs for nearly 50,000 men and women. I became a member of the Central Labor Union as a delegate in 1925. At that time, there were very few unions in numbers organized. The Central Labor Body only had 30 or 40 locals, and they were all small. But then came the big influx of 1933, and Roosevelt was elected. The all, the workers began to give them the right to collective bargaining, and there was a great influx of running right into the thousands. When I first joined the union, my knowledge was we had about 3,000 men organized in Erie. And most of that was building trades. And today, we have between 35 and 40,000, including the General Electric, Teamsters Union, and United Automobile Workers, which are not affiliated, but they're part of the labor movement. <laughs> well, Abe, you know them small Pennsylvania towns. <laughs> Hey, you've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> right. Uh, listen, Abe, I got the note. What, what, what's the problem? The years after World War II produced problems. Jobs were fewer. Housing deteriorated and became hard to find. Suburbs sprawled, sometimes at the expense of the city. The Korean and Vietnamese wars diverted attention and energy. Part of the key to our future may lie in our past, as in the case of rejuvenated port trade. In the late 50s, the then Pennsylvania Railroad closed the ore and coal docks at the Port of Erie with the loss to the port of some five to six million tons in coal and ore. About the same time, the state and federal, the state and city government formed the Port Commission and later became the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority. These organizations were formed to advance commerce at the port as well as industrial development and recreation. The stevedores now are loading a locomotive aboard ship, one of the Likes Brothers ships, the first American ship in the Port of Erie in the past eight years. The crane that is lifting the locomotive is a 300-ton fifth leg crane with the approximate cost of some $1 million, and this is the latest improvement to the Port of Erie with the uh, help of the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority. future is tied to our past, then what of the future? Probably it will follow the patterns of the past. Some features will remain the same, others will shift beyond recognition. Erie, like all cities, is a contradiction. It is the same as, but different from, its sisters across the face of the land. It is a town as well as a city, a metropolitan area as well as a region. Its children have been both known and unknown. Its story yields secrets which bear keeping and successes which should be shouted from the heights. It is, after all, itself, and it will remain eerie. I wander today to the hill, Maggie, to watch the steam below. Where 
This program has been made possible in part with grants from the City of Erie and the Erie Community Foundation.